जय बाबा Francis went back to continuing to write Stay with God. He started at our house in Bondi in August 56 and still working on it. But by the time I got to the uh, after Bible left, he was actually in the process of <coughs> corrections, going through changing, checking. And Lori used to come up whenever she had the time. and see if there's any typing one day in november 1958 she came up and as usual francis welcomed her got out of his chair he had a, a table just there and his chair that he used all the time he's here until he went to india was barbara's commode chair with a piece of masonite as is in barbara's room They always used to sit on her on that, put the typewriter in front of her, and show her what was to be typed. This time he told her to sit down. Said, "I'll make a cup of tea." After tea was made, he said, uh, "He said, well, dear, there's no more typing. I've done all I can. I can't think of anything else. The book is finished. Well, it's to, to the best of my ability." You'll have to stand or fall. The way it is. So about a month later, Francis got a letter from Barbara saying, which he'd been warned about, that Barbara was asking him to come and stay with the Mandali. We all thought, well, if he's lucky three months, if he's extra lucky six months. Even Francis knew that it would be four. It would be. More than his usual two weeks or a month as in 1955. So Francis was very happy to go off with his finished book. But when he got to India, Baba stuck his finger in the book's eye and started to make corrections to Francis' script, telling、uh, different changes he wanted. Uh, dictating three discourses to be included in the body of the work, and then the big job. He asked Francis to write notes for all the references that were in the book that people may not know. So he asked me to.、Uh, he would send a little list,、right? and he asked me to rope in Joanna to help. But I was farming at the time, so I think Joanna did about three quarters of the research, so that could be in, in that book.、Uh, when the book was published, then one of Francis's jobs was Bar-、uh, Barbara wanted this book announced throughout the world, and anyone who knew, it, like for example, Francis. To write to everyone he knew, say in America, in Australia, or anywhere. Barbara asked for five thousand copies, hardback. It's interesting. About four years ago,、uh, the Australian literati got very excited. It was the tenth anniversary. An Australian poet, I can't remember his name,、uh, had written a long poem. Book-length poem, and it had sold two thousand copies. Well, the hardback edition of Stay with God sold ten, five thousand copies. In seventy-four, there was a paperback edition of three thousand copies. And in the nineties, there was another edition with illustrations by John Parry. What was that edition? Four thousand plus five hundred in hardback for America. So that fellow's lost the race. <laughs>、um, then, at the same time, Francis, Bible was getting Francis、uh, to take.、Uh, Indians were giving talks about Baba in India to Indians, and they have a tendency to go on and on and on. 
right? Uh, it might be exciting for people in the audience, but to be printed in a newspaper or magazine, in cold print, Francis said to me. So, so Barber gave him the job of making it printable. And uh, he also started, and he worked from 1959 to 1960, on five long poems. Uh, including the ballad we heard the other night, sang by with their fellow Jacob, very, very nicely too. Um, uh, uh, of a Bell of the Rhyming Night. Bell of the Rhyming Night, yes. And what's the other five in Word of Wells End? Dream of Wet Pavements. Right, that's it. Dream of Wet Pavements and, and the one, first one, whatever that was. Uh, Eh? Elegy to Young Poets. Elegy for the Young Poets, yeah. Dream of Wet Pavements was the first one. But he was writing others at the same time. And uh, so he, he worked on that 1959 to 1960. But he hadn't finished them when he started on a new venture. In 1961, early in 1961, he decided to invent, or try to invent, an English form of the guzzle. I'll come to that in a minute. Here's a letter he wrote in July of 1959. Just to give you an idea of what it was like to be a member of Barbara's Mandalay. The other day, according to Hindu calendar, was Guru's Day, which occurs once a year. Baba had us all collectively pray to God to help us to hold on to Baba to the end. Baba is not a guru in the sense that he teaches us. He has said, I come not to teach but to awaken. What he is, <coughs> is our guru in the sense that he takes over the direction of our lives according to the degree of our surrenderance of our lives to him. Thus, he is at the same time our personal guru <coughs> and avatar to the whole creation. In the evening, he sent for me to come to his room and among other things said, your stay with me so far has been entirely fruitful for me for you and for your group. This your rather surprised me, as I have always felt since 56, when you all met him, that there was now no longer any group, but that each one was under his own steam. The point that makes me happy is that somehow my being with Baba has been of benefit to all because I always feel that the final fruit of anything he does for an individual will be when all enjoy it. Even when I have seen him giving the, bless the blessing of his embrace to thousands, I have not been able not to think, well, what about the millions? The answer apparently is that through the thousands, he does touch the millions. And this touch is a preparation for when he breaks his silence and manifests his full divinity. Now the assumption that I made from this, and I think Francis sort of agreed to it was, was that Harry Kenmore, even if Barbara was in seclusion, had the right to turn up. And he would turn up without announcement. He would just turn up. <coughs> And invariably, Francis got the job of looking after Harry. Harry wasn't very tall, but he was very stocky. I think I said in my book, he's, it was built like a bear, big man. And it, it might have been because of his blindness, and so therefore he couldn't judge where people were. He always spoke in a loud, strong voice. <laughs> anyway, Francis' job was to look after him. And he would be his minder, being blind, which meant a lot of 
tiddling things that have to be done for Harry, this foul and that. One day Baba said to Francis, he said, uh, he said, uh, <clears throat> take Harry into a, a cafe in the town and get him a good meal. Of course, he was eating wonderly food, <coughs> basically rice and a few vegetables and dal. So they're in this crowded Indian cafe. And the first thing Harry wanted was japatis. So the bloke, the waiter brought the japatis, and Harry could start on that. Francis shifted it, so Harry would put out a hand, get the japatis, and start munching away. And then, and then the waiter brought the first dish, first couple of dishes of their meals. And he moved. <laughs> he moved, moved the japatis. And Harry and friends were talking, Harry put out, Japati! Japati! And all the rest of them go, what's going on? What's going on? <laughs> Francis leapt up, grabbed the, here, 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 to quiet them down. <laughs> anyway, one of the things that happened in one of those trips was, Harry persuaded Francis to read the whole of East West Gathering for his tape recorder. And when Francis wrote and told me this has happened, this has occurred, I said, did you sing the songs? <laughs> this was his reply. In regard to taping East West Gathering, no, I did not record the songs of East West Gathering sung. What you take me for with my frog's voice? <laughs> Even the speaking voice is not good. I did not do the recording of my own, but as part of my quote, looking after Harry Kay, close quote, and pleasing him on his last surprise visit. <laughs> and he is an impossible person to do a job with. He will not wait for the mood of the performer, just sets, a, sets up his machine and says, ready! <laughs> <laughs> and won't even play. <laughs> and won't even play back what one does. <laughs> My voice kept breaking down, which was a signal for him to leap up with, I'll fix that. <laughs> I'll fix that in a moment. Seize me and dig his fingers. He was a chiropractor, so he knew all these nerves, <laughs> dig his fingers, Dig his fingers in into certain nerves until I nearly fainted. <laughs> <laughs> and then yell, that's better, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I should have bought tissues. <laughs> no one will ever know but all of us here have suffered, <laughs> for dear Harry's sake. <laughs> I'll read this. One of the things that the men Mandali saw, which none of us who met him at Sardis Farm, 56, 58, East West Gallon, ever saw any evidence of Barbara's suffering. When he was with you, if he's <coughs> Sarvis is his company, and if he's giving his company, he can his all. Even if he was very serious, as he was in 58, he still gave that love. He still gave that company. You could feel it. You really felt it. Physically. Now, at the East West Gathering, we were late. The Australians went by boat, the boat got held up, and we missed the first day. So on the second day, late in the evening, Barbara made arrangements, apparently. Once I, I, um, I, I be Juice, and Barbara had insisted would be the leader of the Sufi. She didn't want the job, but he, he asked her to do it. Now her husband worked for Standard Oil, 
and therefore had lots of trips to Saudi Arabia. And on one trip, Ivy went with him. And she suddenly realised when she was there, Barbara's only a couple of hours away. So she sent a message, can she come and see Barbara? And Barbara said, yes, she could come. She could have five minutes with him and half an hour with the girls. That means the women under him. Half an hour with the <coughs> girls. So the Australian women had not met the women Mundali because they were a day late. The women Mundali were behind a screen behind Barbara watching everything that was going on but couldn't be seen. So it was uh, apparently Barbara arranged that those women who hadn't met the women Mundali could go and see the girls. So they went in. Now Lorna was there and she was standing next to Gova. And then the program outside was finished. Barbara walked through the curtain. Still that radiant witness, that presence. But the moment he was through the door, it all collapsed. His face, Lorna said, his face went from radiant to, he's in the age 10 years. In a second, his body slumped. Lorna involuntar involuntarily said, or oh, escaped her. Ah! Oh. Gava, Gava, grabbed her arm and said, Now you've seen him. Every night he comes in, shining like he is outside all afternoon, and then bang, you see, he's utterly exhausted. Now, with him in Mundali, if Barbara was suffering because of his journal loss of work, they saw it. He didn't hide it from them. If he was radiant, well, they were lucky. So anyway, this is a letter that Francis wrote. Barbara told us at the beginning of this period, this is October 1959, he would have to go through the slaughterhouse. <coughs> Somehow he seems to have borne it all more lightly. He often sits with us, enjoying light chat and humorous bits. In short, enjoying being entertained. At Pune, he lavished love upon us, every day giving us drinks with his own hands and often pieces of cake and such like, which someone coming for his darshan had brought, often taking, it, taking us out visiting homes of his Pune devotees. But he was often very severe and at times grilled one another of us for two or three hours at a time. Back here, at St. Mara's head, he continued to shower us with his love and even small things bring from him an embrace or a kiss. Yesterday morning, he mentioned you dear ones again, that's the Australians. He has also increased his walking distances. Today has been like a holiday. Everyone just about doing nothing. Tonight is the first night of three days Diwali festival. A festival of the chain of lights, which is gratis. Every doorway, windows in India will have a little light made by a wick burning in an open earthenware saucer. And on the side of it, in honor of Lakshmi, the goddess of wealth. Some of you will remember the film The River in villages and towns. They were, they were visiting in general hospitality. Tonight, the businessman closes the last year's ledger and places a new one at his feet. Here also, at Myra's head, every doorway has its own little lights and the main entrance is a fairy land. Now, it was during this period that one of the Mandalay told Francis the story, a story about Lakshmi, the goddess of wealth, the sort of story Francis loved. There was a money lender, and being a money lender, he was an absolute miser. He used to wear old clothes, it didn't matter if they were dirty, worn, 
he was saving his money. And he had a customer, a spendthrift, that he'd lent money to, and he was living the he was living the good life. And the wise man started to get worried about his money. <laughs> this bloke was enjoying too much, and, and he wasn't paying any back. So he decided to go down and see this bloke and get a bit of it back out of him before he spent the lot. So when he went down to the Spencer's house, some of the tough guys outside wouldn't let him in because he looked like a beggar. Anyway, finally a message went, was taken, reluctantly, to the Spencer. Who came out? Oh, my old mate, come in! Dragged him in, and uh, the bloke tried to keep raising the matter of you know, <coughs> money that's on the way. No, oh, don't worry about that, don't worry about that. Put on a feast for him, a lavish feast. In the afternoon brought on musicians and dancing girls. And the miser thinking, you know, all oh, this is, is my money that's being spent. Finally he says, oh, I think I'll go home as it's getting dark and he couldn't get anything out of the way. Oh, oh, don't go, no, 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 there'll be robbers out there. They'll, they'll take all your money. Oh, oh well, I better stay there. <laughs> so more feasting went on and he said, you better stay overnight. So he took him into the bedroom. Two beds. Satin sheets, silk pillows, beautiful drapes and that. The moment the Spencer put his head on the pillow, he was away. The miser lay there thinking, God, oh God how much money this guy's got? Oh, he must be spending a fortune. Will I ever get it back? Twelve o'clock, the door opened. A beautiful woman entered, went straight over to the Spencer bed and started massaging his limbs. And she went on doing this while the miser watched in amazement until dawn, when first light broke. She started to leave. And the miser says, Hey, hey, who are you? She says, I'm the goddess of wealth, Lakshmi. He says, Why are you, why are you massaging her? I'm going to stop thinking about you. She said, he's my husband, you're my slave. <laughs> <laughs> Francis loved that. <laughs> Take your time, Robert. We want to hear it. <laughs> we'll edit that out, Robert. Hey? We'll edit that part out. about his conditions. I have ideal conditions of living and work. I occupy a large room in a line of outbuildings behind the house. This is my resident. Last year, it was occupied by Kaikobad, the old Mandali member, with whom Baba does much work, especially during seclusion periods. But just before we came here, he was sent to Mayorabad for the duration of our stay. There is a window facing east and one west, with a table under each. So I work in the morning on the west side and in the evening on the east, thus being able at both times to work on the shady side, plus being able to lock the door and take off all my clothes enables me to just manage the heat. I put a sheet of blotting paper under my right arm so that perspiration doesn't wet the writing paper, have a towel handy to mop myself now and then, and fire away. No one need ever tell me the advantages of dry heat over wet heat. This is dry heat, so dry that most of the sweat evaporates immediately, and it doesn't cool off much before 2 a.m. 
I have found it quite useless going to bed early. So I generally get in a good spate of work from 9pm to 1am and then I can sleep. Despite this, I don't seem to get much work done. Being with Baba several hours a day is in itself a day's work, after which one tends to just sit around. I have found the best plan is, after Baba leaves us about 4pm, to lie flat on my back for half an hour, sometimes getting a short sleep, have a bath by standing under a tap, which is on one end of the room, make some tea and then get going. About seven, I take a couple of miles walk, have supper, and about nine, as said, settle down to a good, quiet stretch. God is just too big, that's all, <coughs> just too big. I said to Baba one day, the more I see, the more I wonder why anyone wants God realization. It is a big affair. Baba's answer, a chuckle and one kiss. The other day, he called me privately to give me a point on a particular piece of work I am doing. His requirement was simple, yet it seemed impossible to execute. Now, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> just previously, he had reprimanded me over something, a piece of bad conduct. His requirement was simple, yet it seemed impossible to execute. Now, he was putting upon me a piece of work which seemed impossible to do. This extraordinary confidence in me, coming on top of my misery because of his rebuke, was too much for me, and I started to weep. Then he asked, what is the matter? And I start mumbling that everything is too much for me. Then he says, <clears throat> don't get discouraged. You are really doing well, and I am satisfied with you. I only said what I did earlier so that your heart would be more comfortable. <laughs> you see the psychology. You do something wrong, nothing happens. Barbara doesn't say anything. Oh, I got away with it. The ego's happy, but the heart knows. Wrap him over the knuckles. Knuckles? The ego's not happy, but the heart is more comfortable. <coughs> Brilliant. So, your heart will be more comfortable. <laughs> then, then he gives me a kiss and I go out from him bursting with gratitude and happiness. <laughs> then he's stuck in a little poem. Verse on how big God is. If God was the voice within music, he would be easy to sing. One need but listen and utter the note. If he was the glisten of splendour, one could shine and please him, be a mirror reflecting his brightness. If he was the spring of energy, by self-fission, one could storm him with the flame of a question on final issues and arrive and be. <coughs> This God I serve and love is far beyond voices and shinings and questions in the sun. Deaf, blind, aloof to these does not respond, but waits until performances are done. Only the noose of his whim flung in space of heart can catch him to release his grace. Now one of the things that Barbie used to do was to get the men to do a little playlist. This, a break 
from his hard work, yeah, universal work. Francis writes, since the end of October, we have had a series of little plays. Three of these were put on by one Alaba. <laughs> <laughs> they were mostly one man affairs <laughs> with a dialogue <laughs> mostly consisting of the telephone. <laughs> Conversations or orders barked at an unseen squad. In one, there was a radio broadcast in Hindi, Persian and Arabic announcing war. But to make up for the dearth of dialogue, he constructs the weirdest stage machinery. Suddenly, a glow batter starts revolving. Liquid starts bubbling in a glass jar, and the board tips over, revealing a written message on another board, and an alarm bell starts ringing. <laughs> and all constructed out of whatever he can find around the house or in the junk heap. And all moving parts are powered by an ordinary clock. <laughs> <laughs> Mayadas, who when he turned up was Ramdas, the Baba changed it. He was a worker of miracles. He was well known travelling around India and apparently committing the sin of miracles. <laughs> Mayadas has also staged two or three sketches. He, though, uses a company. He is quite a fine actor himself, with a good voice. At present, he is rehearsing a play for Baba's birthday. Nearly all the men have been roped into it. I was offered a role in one of his previous plays, but couldn't, with any hope of accuracy, memorise the right words in the right order and of pronouncing them correctly enough. I became terrified at the prospect of an embarrassed audience through misplacing or mispronunciation of words. For, as in English, it takes only a slight difference in pronunciation to change an ordinary one into an unmentionable one. <laughs> so I had to drop out a pity because the role I had was that of the great sage Nar Narada. <laughs> They are all at rehearsals at night in the moonlight. There is no written script. Mayadas makes up the dialogue and teaches it by word of mouth with accompanying actions at the same time. The story, of course, is from the ancient scriptures, but it will be turned to bring the present avatar Baba into it. This is, after all, quite reasonable. There's only ever been one avatar. Baba doesn't mind whether he's been called Baba or Krishna or Ram. He enjoys it all too. In fact, Baba has taken a hand in making this up. He has cast Kaka, who is a little fella, and Puka, great bear, in the role of husband and wife. <laughs> Kaka, oh, uh, Puka is the biggest and fattest man of the monthly. Poor oh, Kaka, he is 67 years old has been with Baba through every trial and hardship from the beginning and now has to start playing. <laughs> Baba teases them all the time by suggesting situations suitable for the role. <laughs> At one time, Baba was getting Eric to read the newspaper, new stories in the newspaper. And, uh, and, and then he would get the Mandali to act it out. One story Baba really liked was, was a story of uh, two wedding parties in the same carriage. And then an argument broke out on which way the fan would be turned. <laughs> there was no, apparently no compromise. And they turned into a physical fight when suddenly, according to the newspaper, a young man burst into the carriage, waving a revolver and told them if they didn't all shut up, he'd shoot the lovers. <laughs> well, Barbara loved that and got them in. They had to act it out. <laughs> and 
father himself burst into the carriage the way <laughs> if they didn't all shut up and shoot a lot of them. the passage used to write to us about <coughs> was some of the various characters who would turn up. That Barbara's Darshan. A Sanskrit scholar, he's a research scholar attached to the Deccan College which Barbara as a youth attended and which now was a general college. Oh sorry, was then a general uh, college but now is a language school alone and he's been coming here regularly. One morning sitting on the veranda here he wrote a letter in Sanskrit to a scholar friend in Madras. Before sending it he showed it to Baba. It was translated into English by Deshmukh, dear Deshi, and Francis arranged it uh, a little bit poetically. And the letter reads, I have had the darshan of Sri Baba of great glory, the most worshipful one, now for a fortnight. Before this, only his name had come to my ears, and I knew nothing of his life story. When I came face to face with the most worshipful Baba of ascendant greatness, there arose in my mind an inexpressible joy, the kind of peace which, according to the scriptures, enlivened the forms of Nara, Narayana, and others. Exactly that kind of peace is experienced here. One day, when he came into the assembly and sat down, someone <coughs> was reciting in Sanskrit some frivolous verses to Baba. After a few moments, he rose, bowed before Baba, and left. The next morning, after greeting Baba, he sat down, as usual, near Baba. Baba asked him why he had left abruptly the previous day. He said uh, that he had some work to do. Baba said, did you feel disturbed because of the recitation? No matter how much one is disturbed, one should try and remain calm. The scholar, no, no, I was not disturbed, nothing like that. I left because I had to bid goodbye to some guests. Baba, did you feel hurt because of the recitation? Did you feel it was an insult to, to Sanskrit? Scholar, I didn't like it, but that was not why I left early. Baba, even if you felt it was an insult to the language, you should not be affected. I am God. And I am insulted every moment. Yet I never fail to respond with love. Scholar, I am trying to learn to tolerate things that are not to my taste. Baba then gave him some words of encouragement. Later the scholar said, Ah, Baba must really love me. Otherwise, he would not have taken the trouble to correct me. Another character turned up and Francis wrote, There has been a curious codger coming. He wears the saffron robe of the mendicant and all over it is printed Shri Mata, Holy Mother. Somehow it tickled my reverence. In other words, some of the larrikin still left in the Australian. <laughs> and I nicknamed him Dear Mum. <laughs> <laughs> now he has gone to Bombay and writes lots of letters. Eric says to me, Is another letter from Mum? <laughs> He has developed a burning zeal 
to go to darkest Africa and convert all of it to Baba. <laughs> Baba looked so innocently relieved and said to Eric, encourage you to do that. <laughs> that some people not used to him might say, oh, you know, he, 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 he's cranky. Well, he could be. <coughs> but he was also thoughtful. Once, in the early days of Sydney, something happened that upset Francis. He wasn't very happy. And... Um, there's some trivial thing occurred. It might have been making a cup of tea or something. Laura made a cup of tea. But Francis was, was being upset and cranky. And, and, and he had go at Laura over this thing. And Laura regarded that as unjust. And a strong sense of justice. One of the things that happened with Laura when we first started meeting Francis was the fact that when she was 14, she was going, she believed in Jesus, she believed in the Bible, and she went to church every Sunday. St. Stephen's Anglican. It's on Broadway between the railway and the university. And she was 14, and the minister had given a sermon, and a 14-year-old, she, she detected there was something wrong, there was a contradiction. So when she came out of church, she asked the minister, you know, what exactly it meant. He just walked and said, oh, you wouldn't understand. And then we met Francis, and she asked questions. You might not agree that Francis was right, but he would give you an answer. And that's, you know, that was part of our relationship with Francis. And he might get upset about certain things, but they're always from the point of view. Oh, with regard to that business with Lorna, uh, she told him he was a cranky bugger. <laughs> he stopped and he thought about it. For the rest of the day, he was very loving to not only Lorna but everyone. Because he realised what she said was right. He didn't make, make apology, but he, he made verbally he made an apology by his actions for the rest of the day. And so when, take, uh, when Francis takes up some theme, it's always because somehow what the person is doing or saying is leading them away from a clear understanding of Baba's message. So once he let fly in the general letter to all the Australian group, Note on Baba's conversational talk. Since Avatar is the axis of the universe and of every individual particle of it, no word or gesture of his can be without the profoundest significance. As the poet said, speaking of a perfect master of his time, ah, this sudden upheaval of the earth and sky, it is because the master has turned on his side. Notwithstanding, it is absurd for us to try and read significances and inner meanings into Baba's simple actions and general talk. There is no means whereby it could be correct. The only intelligent reaction to the rain god wants me to suffer more yet would be the parrots, the rain god, etc., etc. I remember one day, at the 1955 Sabbath, Baba was walking up and down the meeting hall after lunch. Naturally, a number of Sabbathees gathered in the doorways and watched him. Afterwards, Baba said, When I was walking up and down, some of you were thinking, 
barber is doing his universal work. But as a matter of fact, I was simply digesting my lunch. <laughs> <laughs> the point is, <clears throat> since there is no time when Barbara is not engaged on his universal work, why single out some isolated individual action as being linked with it? It is nothing more than an expression of, we are in the know. We are a little bit more on the inside. The same applies to statements that one has heard or read that Barbara was working through someone or using such and such a situation to further his work or that during his travels he was laying cables. Since Avatar has said is the axis of all things and since his mission is universal there could be no one and no insect through whom and with which he is not working and no situation which he has not created, let alone using. As for cable laying, well, I suppose one person's fancy is as good as another. <laughs> and another situation this would occur, and I can remember going through this particular phase, it was very common, become a real buzzword. But last year, we had a change of divine agency. From Baba doing this or that, it became the workings of Maya, or Maya's hand, <coughs> that was in everything. When someone missed a train connection, or a plane was late, or he couldn't get on it, it was Maya's doing. If someone caught a cold or had a toothache, it was Maya's doing. In some instances, <coughs> it was Maya trying to cause the person to lose their hold on Baba's diamond. <laughs> no one ever said that the promotion or salary raise they got or the pleasant evening that they had had was Maya. Not the nice things. <laughs> Only the unpleasant and uncomfortable things from Maya. The correct definition of Maya is, quote, the principle of ignorance, close quote. That simple and uncomfortably means that every action one does, every breath one draws, is nothing but maya, right up to and including the sixth blooming plane. Poor Barbara. Poor dear beloved Barbara has been saying this over and over and over now for 40 years. <laughs> no wonder he suffers. I mentioned that um, he was writing long poems, 1959 to 1960, then he started developing, or he developed, an English version of the Gazel. So, these long poems he'd been working on, he set them aside. And uh, concentrated on writing guzzles. <coughs> and in 1965, he wrote us, uh, well, uh, it must have started in 64, he then went back to the five long poems and worked on them. You referred to the word of world's end. Though. Word of world's end, yes. <coughs> and he wrote us in January 65 about this book, five sections. He called it then Song of World's End. And it was later changed it to the Word of World's End. And he writes that this book comes before In Dust I Sing, which he uh, uh, wrote to us about, I think I just had that somewhere. Who was that? We can get some pieces out and try to. Sorry. 
Maya Roberts. <laughs> no, Baba. <laughs> His will. There, there was a bloke who was coming to Baba and he was just one amongst the Mandali. And Baba had given him things to do. And when he would turn up, Baba would say, did you, oh no, I, I disobeyed you, Baba. But I think it was a way of getting attention. There was nobody amongst famous people in Mandali because he kept disobeying Baba and Baba would have to correct him on the heck like he said. One day, he wanted to ask Baba why he continued to disobey Baba. But he wasn't game enough to ask Baba himself. So he asked Padre to ask Baal for him. So when one day when Padre was with Baba, he said, he said that this, this fellow wants to know why he keeps disobeying Baba. Baba said, tell that idiot it's because of my will. that's <laughs> 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 Oh, well, I can't remember. <coughs> just the word. Oh, here we are. Uh, so, Francis started writing Guzzles in 1961. And then he got to 1964, and he wrote a letter to us. In February 64, a week before Barbara's birthday. Now, a couple of weeks before that, Lorna had sent a letter, written a letter to Francis, in which she used the phrase, singing dust. We didn't know the title of this book, In Dust I Sing. We never heard what the title was, of the Gospel. And Francis wrote, so Francis wrote this letter. Dear Robin and Lorna, I know that you will be glad to know that I will be placing at our beloved barber's feet on his birthday a new book, in dust I sing. A hundred and fifty fourteen line poems in rhyming couplets in a new form, being a cross between the sonnet and the Persian guzzle, which half is used. For the last six weeks I've been toiling till one or two o'clock in the morning every night, improving the draft and writing a fair copy. Now it is ready. Then, where did Lorna in the last letter get hold of the phrase singing dust? <laughs> Now Francis had based his uh, guzzle form. There, there was a, a, the sonnet was originally in the Italian form, and there were English versions of it. But France, uh, Shakespeare changed that by changing the rhyming scheme and ending up with a sonnet form that ended in a rhyming couplet, and that was the clue to Francis for an English guzzle. Seven couplets of rhyming couplets. Now, when Francis came here, he, he found this problem, gone back to Sydney, and when he came here, he prepared for a long stay to get the place ready for Baba. As far as I know, he only brought one book with him, a book of Shakespeare's sonnets. Now, the house it was where the rose garden is now. It had to be shifted down there. And uh, in order to shift the house, he found out there was a house shifter. His name was Nevi. He came from Gainda, which is about 50 kilometers northwest of here, Mandarin country. But he found out Nevi was working, doing a job at Kabulchum. So he contacted him there, and he came from there to advertise a boat to move the house, which is a big job. <coughs> And it takes weeks of work, particularly as during the month he was here, it rained at 30 inches during the month of April. So the house has to be jacked up on railway lines, the stumps dug out, holes dug for the dug for the stumps in the new position, and of course they probably filled up with rain, <laughs> and that be bailed out, and then it rained again <laughs> before they get the stumps there. It's a long job. So maybe. And he had a 21-year-old uh, helper. And uh, the helper was 21, 
and, and we knew he had a girlfriend up in Uganda. Of course, that was due to go from Kabulja back to Uganda, but they came here. You know, one night after everyone was digesting Lorna's meal she cooked for the, for the mob, and everyone was, well, it was exhausting, it's hard work. You know, you know, day after day, six days a week. So Francis entertained them all, including Nevi and the young fellow, by reading one of Shakespeare's, oh, by reading some of Shakespeare's sonnet. And he started with the sonnet that begins, Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? By the time he was halfway through the sonnet, the young fellow, he was missing his very own song of the day. All right, this is power. Right. So then in that was in '64 he presented that book to Barber, and uh, he was going to present Song of World's End to Barber in Barber's birthday, 65. So he explains that this book comes before in dust. One of the sections remains yet to be retyped. I will try and get a copy to you by the 1st of the 1st, 1970. Uh, no, that's May, so it's way earlier. 64. No, it must be 71. Whatever. <laughs> so you can start reading it on that day. Uh, its general reading can be at the next anniversary. I should uh, keep in mind, uh, I had it in mind to present it to beloved Barbara on his birthday. But since this book is in a very modern idiom, I didn't know whether Barbara would really like it. So I read it to him and he enjoyed it very much. Now I have nothing for his birthday. I should have finished with something dramatic like Photograph Maya. So I'll have to end limply with Jemar. <laughs>